Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian. And it's so great to be joined again by the man who ages like Merlot <laughs> and I age like milk. <laughs> the great Pete Carmichael, director of the Civil War Institute at Gaysburg College. Pete, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Uh, Rachel, uh, before I introduce you, I just want you to know that as our, uh, what can we call it, our season has progressed, John has become more and more comfortable, with, <laughs> you know, very creative. Uh, in <laughs> yeah, it's all about the intro. I like it. <laughs> yeah. You got the music for us. I think we need to get something, though, that I don't know, a little more edgier. <laughs> I'll work on that for next season. I'm, okay. I'm into, uh, and I'm serious, the Notorious B.I.G. is awesome. Oh, I, man. I, go, I come to things very late. I just started listening to Nirvana like a year ago. Oh my god! And uh, no, I'm okay with it. It's fine. But the Tour <laughs> PIG is awesome. Well, you um, got to listen to the Slow Burn season three. They they mm. cover the Tupac and Biggie um, feud, and it's very good. Mm -hmm. I highly we're, recommend it. Where Slow would I Burn. Slow Burn. Slow Burn. Yeah. Mm. Where would one find this? Uh, any kind of podcast. Uh, yeah. facilitator, Apple Podcasts oh, or podcast. Spotify or anything like that. The first season is about Nixon, yeah. uh, but the third season is about Tupac and Biggie. It's very yeah. good. Another great podcast is The Archives with Jill Lepore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's new, right? It's just yeah. brand new. Yeah. yeah. I I'm, I'm a massive fan of hers. I, I really like her stuff. She spoke at NCPH, National Council of Public I, I got to put in a plug for another podcast that actually, yeah. an episode that I was on today, yeah. uh, which is Adam Smith's podcast, Last Best Hope, which the Rothermere Institute puts out. Um, and, you know, it comes from the Abraham Lincoln line and his uh, second message to Congress, uh, you know, that the United States is the last best hope of earth. And so I was on the, I was on the episode today and there are five episodes with a number of different historians that I highly recommend it. So yeah. you're all warmed up for us. I am, I'm warmed up. up. <laughs> Shouldn't have told it that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let me uh, give our audience a little background on Rachel. She is a native of Chicago and she is a diehard, not Cubs fan. She's a diehard White Sox fan, mm. which the Cubs are always fans are always whining about how long. <laughs> right. I mean, White Sox fans are is it, maybe had it tougher, or is not? Is it impossible? To uh, it's about the same. I mean, we we uh, conquered the the problem of not winning a World Series a bit earlier than the Cubs, but not very much earlier, frankly. <laughs> we just yeah. whine about it less. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Rachel is also a fascinating parenting technique. Uh, that I try to emulate as well with not much success, and that is she is showing her children old White Sox games, That's but true. to them, it's not old, it's in the moment. <laughs> so she's occupied plus making them die hard fans. Her it's brilliant, brilliant, much I to the chagrin of my Tigers fan husband, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know he was a Tiger. <laughs> yeah. So, how do you do that? You all when you all go back to the Midwest, do you like split? We're going to do so many games for the Tigers and so many for the White Sox. Yeah, we we often go to more White Sox games because my family and friends are more pushy about it. But we have been to some Tigers games too, and yeah. and my sons do root for the Tigers. Also, we just spend a lot more time with the White Sox. <laughs> I won't. I promise I'll get off this. <laughs> Your favorite White Sox player of all time. Uh, I, I really love Paul Canerco, who was, you know, one of the most important players in the 2005 World Series and um, really all that season. He was he's, you know, been a, a long favorite of mine. But I also really love Frank Thomas yeah. from the 90s. So I was glad Frank got a got a ring in uh, 2005 because he was he still make, on the team. Will he make the Hall of Fame? Oh, yeah. Oh, he should, yeah, he should. First ballot. He's already he's already he's Is already. He? Made it, yeah. yeah. Okay, my I lost track of baseball uh, <laughs> before I, I don't want to say this, but I will. I think probably before you were even born. My oh. last memory of baseball is the big red machine. Oh, yeah, I, mm. so, I yeah. like the Cubs for a little bit, but yeah, I've not been able to connect uh, for some reason. Well, you know, it helps to have a child that's really obsessed. So <laughs> my children make a point that if I really like it, they go in the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
teenage girls. So, Rachel, we're thrilled to have you on. Let me just say a little bit about Rachel's non-sporting interest. <laughs> Growing up in Chicago, she ventured off to Stanford uh, for her undergraduate degree. I believe you didn't major in history, or you did? I, I did. Yeah. Did. I did. worked with Jack Rakove and um, George Fredrickson. Oh, oh that's cool. Yeah. Know. And then from there to the University of Virginia, where she studied under Michael Holt. Um, Michael Holt is one of the great political historians of, uh, of the sexual crisis from the 1850s. A lot of important books Michael Holt wrote. wrote um, I would say the most recent, right, would be really the Whig Party. He's done some things after the Whig Party, but his Whig Party book is the one he really sort of stands on. Yeah, that's the one he cares the most about, certainly. It yeah. took him a long time to write it, and it was very important to him. He has a, a very good book on the election of 1876 that I recommend. Oh, and yeah. when was that published? Uh, maybe 2015, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe 2016, yeah. And, and Rachel also worked with Gary Gallagher, and in fact, she edited a book with Dr. Gallagher um, on, based on politics and sectionalism, uh, right, as, as well. University of Virginia uh, published that book. That's right. But her dissertation, Washington Brotherhood, here it is. Oops. <laughs> Got a little bit of glare. Sorry about that, Rachel. That's all right. Uh, no, Rachel, I have a plastic sheet on your book. I'm you, impressed. You made the first cut. All you right. Cut it, <laughs> right. That means I actually use it because I don't want to damage it. Aww. Because I think I told you, uh, University of North Carolina is offering a discount. Uh, yeah. And we're going to get into it uh, in a very deep way here in just a little bit. Oh, exciting. But I <laughs> want to note, you know, I think sometimes students of the Civil War, those who aren't in the academy in particular, they sometimes shy away from political history. They shouldn't. I think sometimes they shy away because, uh, I don't know, they don't find the prose maybe as engaging or as readable as, as they might find in other narratives. This book reads extraordinarily well. Oh, thank you. It's really driven. It's driven by people doing things, ideas, actions. They just come alive in this book. It's very imaginative, and I think within the methodology of political history, it stands out. Uh, oh, thank you, Pete. Uh, that's absolutely <laughs> the case. No, we, you know, we had last Thursday or last Monday was uh, a person that you work closely with is Michael Woods. Ah, uh, yeah, good pal I mean, of mine. Yeah, yeah he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. and I'm so happy for him at the job at Tennessee. Yeah, but, you know, I think for our folks out there, if you want a different angle, a different approach, and we've got some. Again, I don't want to sound like the old fogey that I am, but some young, younger historians, Michael Woods and Rachel. Absolutely. So, Rachel, we're going to get back to this. Here it is again. All right. All right. <laughs> so one of the things that Rachel, and of course, in telling everything about Rachel's background, I didn't get Rachel in the present. Uh, she recently left the University of Oklahoma. Uh, she was there for a number of years to come to Penn State. Go, go PSU. Yeah. I, I was there for God knows how many years. <laughs> My only distinction there is I never saw a single football game in person. Oh, no, I've already game. beaten you. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't because I was taking a stand. I wasn't. <laughs> you know, when you're a grad student, you just feel... You're busy. And you feel nerdy. Like oh. I never went to any UVA football games when yeah. I was there. So yeah. there you go. Well, UVA <laughs> didn't have the band that Stanford had. Right. No, that's right. And I went to every Stanford football game. <laughs> so uh, Rachel's now at Penn State, where she is the director of the Richards Civil War Center. We have talked about it, John and I have, on the show. The Richards Center um, serves our field in a variety of ways. And Rachel, feel free to amend what I'm about to <laughs> but I would say, you know, the primary purpose of the Richards Center is really serving more of an academic audience. However, however, they get Penn State undergrads out into the field. Usually place at least one student at Gettysburg National Park as well as I believe one at Harper's Ferry. Okay. Uh, so they are certainly very much committed to undergraduate education, but they also work very closely in the academic field because they, how do I explain the relationship, Rachel, to the journal, which our audience is aware of, yeah, we we pu we publish it in conjunction with University of North Carolina Press. So, um, you know, we we run the journal from the sense of we have the managing editor in our offices, and we hire the various editors who write for the journal and who work on the journal. So, we we just hired um, 
Kate Mazur and Greg Downs to be the new editors starting in January this past year. And so we, we're really um, the home for the journal. Yeah. And rather than me describing, Rachel, what I think you do at the center, it probably makes a hell of a lot of sense for you just to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so well, I, you're right to say that we're we're at primarily an academic center. So our our um, biggest role is in facilitating the journal um, and in conferences and the Bros lecture series, which is the preeminent lecture series in Civil War history. Three lectures um, usually happens in October or November, uh, and a prominent Civil War historian comes and delivers them. It usually becomes a book. Um, by University of North Carolina Press also. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, our most recent lecturer, uh, Lorian Foote, gave just wonderful, wonderful lectures uh, last fall. Time. Yeah, mm -hmm. she it, keep an eye out for her excellent book that will be coming out in the next couple of years that comes from these lectures. She's just, they were dynamite. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Rachel, if you haven't noticed, every time you or us, we say UNC Press, we get a little kickback. <laughs> well, we're we're super lucky to work with them. You know, they they also publish the journal, so I work pretty closely with Mark Simpson Voss. We, you know, we have a lot of um, interests that are intertwined, so it's not a surprise that uh, I will also mention UNC Press quite a bit as we go here. <laughs> yeah. So we also have workshops. We help sponsor the SCWH. So um, I know you said you had Nina Silver on recently, and she must have talked some about it. And we we just provide the opportunity for people to come and um, show off their work and to collaborate. So in the spring, we'll be hosting, um, next spring, we'll be hosting a, a workshop um, for the Journal of the Civil War era for a special issue. And um, we'll bring all the people from the special issue together, mm -hmm. just like cool. what we did actually for the special issue that I edited in December, um, oh, in December 2020 issue, mm -hmm. uh, 2019 issue, I should say, sorry, um, that uh, is on federalism. We brought everybody to Penn mm -hmm. State and, and had a workshop where we went through these things together. So we're, we think of ourselves as um, providing the opportunities for scholars. And then the other big way we do that is by hosting postdoctoral fellows um, and helping to guide them toward through the job process. This is one. Um, so uh, John, jump in here. Uh, I have another question about, about the center. I, I have some memory of either the center or maybe it was the School of Liberal Arts at Penn State, but they have a program in the summer that um, is committed to bringing uh, people of color who yes. might be interested in graduate school or in graduate school and interested in the academy. That's right. One of the things that John and I have talked about again is uh, the ways in which our field can become more open and expansive to people of all backgrounds. And so would you mind talking a little bit? Yeah, thank you for mentioning that because this is a really important part of what we do. I mean, we're very committed to trying to diversify the academy um, and to create more of a pipeline for our faculty and students of color um, to be successful. So we're working really closely with the new um, center that is at Penn State now called the Center for Black Digital Research that's mm -hmm. headed by Gabrielle Foreman and Shirley Moody Turner. Um, and we're working with them to bring in graduate students to work on digital projects. They, they run the Colored Conventions Project, which is wonderful. Uh, we have an African-American history postdoc, which we've had for, um, this will be our 10th year. Um, and then we've been unbelievably successful in placing those folks in, in tenure track jobs. And then the program that you mentioned, we call it the Emerging Scholars Summer Mentoring Program. And we bring 10 to 15 students of color for free to Penn State um, to have a, about five or six days of intense, this is what graduate school is, this is how you apply, here are some materials that you can use to apply, here's the way you um, ask for letters of recommendation, here's what a um, seminar looks like. And we've had real success with that too. We've had a lot of students going to graduate school yeah. as a result. Yeah. I, I think, and, and, and you know what, John, I'm actually going to let you speak to this if you don't mind. So I'm, yeah, I'm full of questions to me. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> John, 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 you're, you're, and you've talked about this on the show, so I'm not revealing anything. You're first generation, right? 
yeah. and, and you've gone and get your master's. Mm -hmm. Did you, you mind just sharing what you found to be some of the challenges of being a first generation when you get into college? So I think some people in our audience who might have a hard time understanding what that transition is like for somebody who might not have, again, that background and that support that other students might have. Uh, first year or first time university student and, and a family is kind of an awkward thing for some people. And it was kind of awkward for me because I kept hearing, are you going to be a student forever? Uh, <laughs> are you a professional student? Um, uh, how long is this going to take? And et, et cetera, et cetera. Even though I was paying my own tab, it was still the idea of timing. Uh, the challenge for me was trying to find a mentor because I didn't have a mentor in house, literally in house who I could go to and be like, you know, my grandfather and be like, Hey, what was it like? You know, what should I look forward to or whatever? Uh, it was, it was one of those things where networking from almost day one was very important to me trying to find a professor who I could communicate with, who was relatively in the same era of, uh, you know, history that they worked with that era that I was really intrigued with, uh, was very important. So I really had to come out of my shell. Uh, believe it or not, I was a big time introvert for the longest time. And it wasn't until I went to university that I had to learn that I had to speak up and really think about uh, connecting with people, being the first one to go up and shake hands when we could shake hands. Uh, and 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 say hello and introduce myself and learn how to come out of that shell because it was a very important thing to do for my future and possibly help another student out or another professor out with some research. So it was one of those things where, uh, you know, you had to kind of tune out the the noise around you from from those even in your own family, maybe who wondered what you were doing. Uh, why do you want to study history? Are you going to teach? Uh, this is, it was the usual thing, you know, uh, uh, the usual questions that you get. It's drowning that out and understanding that you know better than anybody else what you want to do with your life. Um, no one else knows as much as you do about what you want to do. And coming out of that shell and just being able to talk to people, even when it's uncomfortable, just come out of your shell and just say, hi, I'm John. I need to talk to you about this because I can't turn to anyone else at my house, <laughs> you know. Uh, I think that was the most important step for me was just understanding that I had to stand up and say, this is what I want to do with my life and um, and try to embrace that and try to embrace this new way of thinking because I, I didn't know what I was getting into in the university, uh, you know, in academia. I had no idea. And so when I my family really didn't understand anything about what I was doing until uh, I was accepted to Western University. And they're like, wow, our grandson's getting a PhD. It's amazing. <laughs> then it clicked. They're like, wow, this is awesome. <laughs> They're like, oh, we're going to have a doctor in the family. Well, so. you know, John, I think, you know, what you speak to and, and, and the program that Rachel just described at Penn State, I think more than ever, we need to remind ourselves that while I'm not suggesting that things are perfect, and I'm not suggesting that there isn't a lot more that we can do on that front and reaching out to students who are underserved and who are first generation, I think, though, we need to always acknowledge the important strides and good work that we're doing in this area. Yeah. Right. And again, that's not saying we've crossed the finish line, mm -hmm. but it, it keeps us as a profession and as a people from sort of slipping off the edge here in a way that we just all we see is just everything sort of cascading down and everything. So mess up. It reminds me of the Park Service here, Barb Sanders. And I believe maybe Rachel, you've met Barb. I'm not sure. I'm communicating with her yeah. by email. <laughs> I saw Barb Sanders, as our audience knows, is uh, Cameron and Isabel, my daughters. Their favorite Civil War historian in Gettysburg. Yeah, she's awfully good. But she uh, oversees a program call, called the Great Task Program. And it's a program that reaches out to not just teachers, but also to students from underserved areas with the Baltimore and Philadelphia. I'm hoping someday they'll go into Appalachia as well uh, because this Battlefield Park, despite what the perception is, the audiences are more diverse, not again where we want them to be, but without us acknowledging where we've made important strides, I, I feel like um, people just sort of give up. What's the point? But you know well, what? I, I think what's useful about that, Pete, is that um, 
we have made some strides and being able to talk about those strides as a, as a jumping off point for the enormous number of strides we need to make going Absolutely. forward. Absolutely. You know, I think um, this moment in particular is a good moment to say, oh, we have some programs and we do have some programs we need to tout, but we need to do much more. And the Richard Center especially is committed to doing much, much more. And, um, you know, I think I think it's a good it's a good time to be thinking about that and and where we can take it. And I'll say one more thing to that. I'm in perfect agreement with you. And I've already had some discussions, very informal, uh, with the Park Service and obviously with the college and with some local churches. And and I think more than ever, we have to reach out to the public. And no offense to anyone who's on Twitter, including myself. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of that's an echo chamber. I think often it confuses some well-intentioned people who think they're engaging in some kind of political action. If it is, it's low-grade stuff. Because what would really serve us more than ever now is to reach out to people, to actually see them in the flesh, to have yeah. those conversations. And so we're in the process. Uh, I'm, it's going to be a program entitled Disposability of Black Bodies right? mm -hmm. from Slavery to Black Incarceration. Again, doing what I think historians do so well, our great purpose, I believe at least in part, is be historic specific. When you use the terms white supremacy, these are not timeless terms. We've talked a lot about Barbara Fields on this show. Yeah. And, well, and you know, I think that again, helping audiences think about that. And I also believe that a lot of people, when you say black incarceration, that's a very difficult thing for them to understand. What is that actually about? And what yeah. behind it? So I'm hoping that we'll get some of these public conversations and I hope they'll take places in churches and I hope the park service will be there. I hope I've not again got any agreement and, uh, and it will be there as well. Well, Don't so I think that's really, uh, that's great. And I think, um, I think one thing to keep in mind in this moment is that although we do want to do a lot with the public and with people one-on-one, um, -on -one, the scholarly work is really important. Um, because it provides the basis by which we can have those kinds of conversations. So I'm thinking in particular about um, an article in the New York Times on Friday in honor of Juneteenth that um, Jamal Bowie wrote, where he talks about the importance of enslaved people freeing themselves and running away to union lines. And um, he's able to do that because we've had 20 years of scholarship that just says that's right there's no there's no, nothing to be concerned about um it hasn't filtered out to everyone <laughs> and and then is you know there's still concern about whether lincoln freed the slaves but you know our ability our ability to change that narrative to talk about what enslaved people were able to do gives the possibility for someone like jamel Bowie, who writes for the new york times to mention that kind of work I think you're, you're, you're spot on we have to operate on both fronts. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you. I mean, Rachel and I are friends and we can agree and disagree. <laughs> but some mornings I wake up and I think, you know what? I wish all these academics would just call time out for a year mm. and really just devote themselves. Like how many people outside of Center County would, I think, maybe be open to having some of these conversations in which I've talked to some folks and now, when you say Black Lives Matter, you can imagine what the response is. Yeah. So I, you know, again, I, I, I'll be honest, I, I'm somewhat conflicted about that, but agree overall, you got to operate on both fronts. Uh, well, and, you know, one thing that I think is kind of interesting about this is that historians are doing a ton of stuff in the public now. We yeah. are, we really are. I, you know, there are all these critiques about how historians are not in the public eye. It, there are so many outlets, podcasts and newspaper articles and the wonderful series made by history in the Washington Post. They, historians are doing tons of stuff. We're, we're all over the place. <laughs> I can't believe that you weren't, I uh, got your mind right with this. Do you not remember what we were subjected to? <laughs> Exactly what I was thinking about. <laughs> George Will came to the Gettysburg Foundation. It was a wonderful evening, and the foundation raised a lot that of was money. Terrific, yeah. So what did George Will say to us? 
He told us that historians are the problem. <laughs> he said, nobody is doing political or military history anymore. No, no one. No, no historians no. do that. They don't no. care about contingency. They they only care about outside forces. Yeah. And I, I was sitting at a table with some folks and I, I said to them, you know, that's kind of interesting because I I can think of, you know, four major civil war centers in on the East Coast and they're run by two political historians and two military historians. So I don't really know what he's talking mm -hmm. about. <laughs> it was quite a night. It was a great night for the foundation. It was. But, but to hear that, that, that speaks exactly. Oh, it makes me, it makes me frustrated. But, you know, one of the other things about that, and, and um, if you spend any time talking to Mark Simpson Voss about, about this kind of thing, you'll hear it, is that um, university presses are not noticed in the way that they should be. And um, university press books are not, do not win the awards the way that popular presses do, even though they're producing incredibly good work and incredibly readable work. So I, I think that's part of the problem too, is you know so, somehow the academic work needs to be appreciated better in popular circles. I don't know how to change that, but that seems yeah. to me to be a big problem. No I, no, I do. I think you're right. And speaking of, for example, the New York Review of Books, though, right. I, I mean, hell, they barely ever review academic right. books. They usually do Yale and maybe a Harvard, and that's about it. That's uh, exactly right. Yeah, you're 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 exactly right about that. And um, the publishing field is is very very different. The good news about academic books is they stay in print forever. That's true. <laughs> well, maybe not forever, but print. often for a long time. <laughs> for a long time. Well, I'm going to segue really quick and get a big question, then I'll turn it over to John. And uh, again, is you know, Rachel? Of course, is no surprise. You're dealing with two historians. We do background checks. We dig. Oh, deep. okay. We dig deep. I really enjoyed um, this piece you did for Civil War history on the state of the field. And oh, thank you were you. interviewed on Civil War, HNet Civil War. Yeah, right? H Civil War. H yeah. Civil War. <laughs> H Civil War. John, do you see that at all? H Civil War? Yeah, Civil I've been on there several times. Yeah. I, I'm just saying, you know, that's again another thing. I wonder how many people are aware of H Civil War. Not, yeah, probably not many. Not many. And, and you could sign up for free. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's again it's it's accessible. It's there, but a lot of people don't know about it, and uh, we need to change it. Yeah, that's a great great place to find sort of commentary, really accessible commentary on what people have written. So you know, um, the, the interview that I did is it, my piece is not always accessible to people, but you can get the gist of a lot of what I've said from well, the yeah, um, from the interview. I, and so I'm going to steal a little bit from that interview. And okay. <laughs> give us a fresh take, or you can, I guess, in essence, repeat, repeat your answer. So let's just talk about the field of political history. We talked um, a little bit about it in some of our previous shows. I'll throw up again for the straw man here, and that is that one, the political history doesn't really get much attention anymore. It's all social history. It's all cultural history. And so students who so badly need this, particularly at a time like this, Man, they're not getting it. And worst of all, no one's being trained in it to really write any of these books. All right. Yeah, so I, I don't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think political history is extremely fresh right now. We've got lots of great political historians writing incredible, um, incredibly different kinds of histories. You mentioned Michael Woods. Um, another person we could mention who would be, uh, we should, you should definitely check out her book is Manisha Sinha, who wrote an important book on um, the history of the abolitionist movement, the slaves, co uh, the slaves cause. Um, you know, really great books on the the war period. Adam Smith, who I mentioned, who um, runs the Rothamir Institute, has a wonderful book called The Stormy Present. Great books on Reconstruction. Um, Greg Downs' book After Appomattox is one that I would I would particularly recommend. So you know we're we're actually producing an enormous amount of political history. I think the knock that some people have is that it doesn't look like the political history that they expect. So um, it's not presidentially focused, or maybe it's not focused on Congress in the way that they would expect it would be focused. But one thing I say in the piece, and I, I think this is really important, is that it actually has never looked that way. Political history has been really innovative forever. 
Um, and it, just going back 50 years, you can see political historians adopting all kinds of different methodology. Michael Holt, who you mentioned, who was my advisor, um, he was using all kinds of social science uh, work. <laughs> he did regression analysis in, in his <laughs> books. Uh, and this was really popular. He was not alone. This was really popular in, in the period where um, that was called the new political history. Mm -hmm. So being innovative is something that political historians are actually able to do very well, mm -hmm. in part because we, especially in this period, we have to understand a lot about other kinds of history. And so, you know, we have to be able to draw from cultural history and social history. So maybe that's what people are uncomfortable with, that the political history that they're reading now looks slightly different from what they expect. And certainly my book is very much grounded in cultural history um, in really understanding people and their behavior. And so maybe that would lead some people to say that's not really political history, but in fact it is. And in fact, we've been doing these kinds of really innovative things for a long time. I would say one other thing about it, which is that um, I get students a lot who really do, who say, oh, I hate political history. And I think they, what they imagine it to be is some awful book their father is reading uh, on, you know, on Teddy Roosevelt or something like that. And, and part of our task is to show students that political history is so much more than that. And when I tell people about what it is, I say, you know, it's about, it's about everyday governance. It's about the way that you interact with the government, the way that the government interacts with you, uh, how you interact with voting, how you interact with um, policies and from the local all the way up to the national. And that, that is part of your life all the time. <laughs> and I'll underscore this in the general with John. It, what you said reminds me of what I would even say about military historians and where we are just, I think, in general as a field, that if you're doing meaningful work, you're searching for the totality of a person's experience. Yeah. So my book on the common soldier, if someone were to say, well, that's military history, well, they clearly haven't read the book. I mean, it's social history, it's cultural history, of course it's military history. Same thing with political history. You, you yeah. can't do a sort of a pure po political history. Or it, it, that notion of a pure political history is is an impoverished view of politics. You, you got to do the yeah. cultural and social stuff as well. So I think what you're doing, and I think where we see much of the field is, you know what, we bring in a lot of these angles. Yeah. We're trying to seek the fullest complexity of a particular moment. So, you know, I think this is an argument that historians now have, right? Is there such a thing as a field? Right. Can you be a political historian? Mm -hmm. Can you be a social historian? In the piece, I make the argument that there is such a thing as political history, but the way that you should define that is by looking at the question that the historian is asking. So if you're asking a question about governance, you're writing a political history. You're using all kinds of other history to get to the answer to that, but you're writing a political history. But if you're writing a, you're writing a, a book or an article where the question is about the environment or about soldiers or about something else, something totally different, uh, then you're writing that kind of history, but you're using all of these tools. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've heard several uh, professional historians, academic historians who uh, say they don't call themselves military historians anymore. Or, yeah. or some of them even flat out say, I don't call myself a civil war historian anymore yeah. because it's too cliche. So yeah. I, I do I do like uh, mid, mid 19th century gender studies or something like that. And they run with that instead of. Yeah. I, I don't think I could get away with that because my my last book was about Congress and I'm currently writing a book about the Supreme Court. I just, <laughs> it doesn't really get much more uh, specific than that, I think. So, it's so timely. It's, it's so timely. <laughs> Uh, Rachel, I have a I have a question about uh, kind of what I like to ask when I when I interview people about their books, but also their their educational work in classrooms. And that is uh, since since you wrote about uh, Annabelle and politics and such, what's like the one big misconception that just drives you crazy with when people when a student asks a question, you're like, you know what they're going to say, <laughs> or, or, if you're, or if you're at a civil war round table or or a, a conference. Uh. What's that one thing if it's got that one misconception? Like when you talk about the Battle of Gaysburg, people are like, oh, I went there for shoes. Like, here we go. Here <laughs> I got to get ready. Mm. Uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think I think really my my the, my book is sort of based around the idea of the misconception that um, 
congressmen from the North and South hated each other, that they were constantly fighting and that, you know, war was inevitable because they were constantly fighting and they were bringing that to the, to the nation. So um, I think, I guess that's my most frustrating one because I wrote a whole book of, opposed to that idea <laughs> and, and people have not believe it. Um, but yeah, I think, I think uh, I get very frustrated with um, sort of the standard lines about Lincoln. I think Lincoln get, get comes in for all kinds of misconceptions. I have students who come in uh, who say, you know, um, Lincoln was completely abolitionist from the beginning, uh -huh. and, and I often have to have to work with that. And and then I often get the opposite. You know, Lincoln was the worst. Yeah. He was the worst. Uh -huh. um, so you know, I think I think that's part of part of what we're fighting against is sort of these preconceptions. I I would say every time I teach the Civil War era, the whole class is pretty much devoted to to busting myths. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no way around it because there's, it's so much in our popular culture that we can't avoid having that kind of conversation all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, Rachel, with your book, and you just mentioned that um, you wanted people to understand that the sectional divide between among congressmen, and senators. That it didn't turn them into bitter enemies, that they weren't at each other's throats all the time. I'd like for you, though, to help us in a very sort of concrete way. Understand how, I think the word you use, sociability, right? Sort of the, sort of the more of the, the personal and, and almost private side. Yeah. Right. Which, again, so important, especially for our students, right? Can you tell us, so give us some examples of how that personal private side, how did it shape and influence? And you can obviously take your pick uh, of something from your book that helps us see a political moment from a different angle. Sure. So, you know, um, there's sort of a standard story that people tell about the Compromise of 1850. Um, so the famous compromise that, that um, tells us that um, California is going to come into the union as a free state and um, that we're going to have the fugitive slave law. Um, so, you know, really important piece of legislation. And, and there's sort of a longstanding story about how that came about that you know, uh, Henry Clay and Daniel Webster gave these really important speeches. And, and I'm thinking of this in part because of the background to this discussion, um, which is a, a famous painting of Henry Clay speaking on the on the Compromise of 1850. Uh, and so there's this misconception that, you know, these guys got up and, and gave these speeches and everybody was won over. Um, but in fact, it was an incredibly tense uh, session. People were arguing all the time. There was a there was a uh, a crazy threat uh, on the floor of the House between, or on the floor of the Senate between two senators that uh, almost resulted in a duel. Um, and it lasted all summer, actually well past when um, Clay and Webster would be giving these speeches. And so uh, part of my book describes how um, several people in Washington held these really important dinners uh, in which congressmen and senators were invited, especially those who were on the fence. Uh, and they were they were pressured to think about what would be good for them. Uh, Webster was actually one of these folks, and um, the the famous uh, uh, Washington D.C. socialite William Corcoran. He has a, a whole gallery named yeah. after him now. Uh -huh. uh, you know, yeah. wined and dined all these folks. Mm -hmm. It it was a real pleasure to go to a to a William Corcoran dinner. Oh, yeah. uh, Webster was always in debt and and um, especially to Corcoran and and Corcoran forgave Webster's debts after his famous speech on the Compromise of 1850. So huh. there were a lot of people with an interest in actually changing the circumstances of how votes were going to be because they believed the union was in serious danger. And they did this by pressuring behind the scenes, um, but by bringing people together in a, in a place where they would feel comfortable that was often cross-sectional. So you would end up with, um, you know, a senator from Massachusetts with a senator from Alabama sitting at the same table having a conversation. Right, right, right. And, and then John, I'll, I'll let you get a whack in here in just a moment. Um, but can you help us again understand or I should say how you reconciled. So we got the congressional record, right? And I yeah. think that that's kind of been foundational to how we've tried to understand much of uh, the political wrangling of the 18th. Yeah. So we got that, that's very public, right? 
And now you've got this other side. So how how does this sort of mesh together without leaving us all sort of confused? Like, yeah, yeah. Not- I love talking about the Congressional Globe, which I I don't. Um, so I I make the argument in the book that the Congressional Globe is is a really flawed document, much like most documents in the 19th century, right? We can't we can't take anything as gospel, but we we for a long time have assumed that the Congressional Globe gives us a real picture of what was going on in Congress. Um, but the Congressional Globe was was a fiction in many ways. Um, it, it could tell us sometimes what was happening on the floor, but usually what it did uh, is it gave a report of what congressmen and senators wanted it to say um, and wanted it to say, for their constituents back home, not what they wanted it to say for their colleagues uh, in Washington. And it was well known that people would get up and give these long and serious speeches that were completely designed for their constituents. They called these bunkum speeches. Uh, we have lots of those still in the 21st yeah. century. Huh. <laughs> this is a longstanding tradition. Huh. If you thought it was new, uh, just, it's not. Just, just turn on C-SPAN. Right? right, just turn on C-SPAN. Yeah. And it was very similar in that way where you would have a, a congressman in the house get up and, and deliver a long and serious speech and not a single person in the chamber would be listening. Not a single person. They would be doing other things. They would be sleeping. They would be drunk. They would be in the other chamber. They would be in the Supreme Court, which was in the basement of the Capitol. Throwing um, paper airplanes at each other. <laughs> you can imagine that some kind of version of that. <laughs> and and they didn't have staffs, so they often you know spoke to constituents who were allowed on the floor. Certain certain people were allowed on the floor in that time if you had served in Congress before, for example. Uh, and so they would meet with those folks on the floor in the house and have conversations with them. They'd be writing letters to their wives, very frequently writing letters to their wives and to their constituents. And so we assume that the congressional record was this document that really shows us the negotiation, but that wasn't really happening. It it was happening behind the scenes. It was happening in places like uh, those dinners that I mentioned, and also in boarding houses and hotels in places where congressmen lived uh, and, you know, over drinks at dinner. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, one of the most important accomplishments of your book. You have recovered for us an entire side, an important side, an essential side of the lives of these men and their wives. We should know is there part of these throwing these these dinners as well. And they're making observations and they're having a voice in their own way. And I think that that recovery, that's that is an important accomplishment. John, again, if you have a question, John, or if we have any questions online, we can toss those out. Of course, I I'm always quick to reload. You always have a follow up. <laughs> Rachel, I have a I have a question that uh, we we often hear today about people being inside the Washington bubble. Yes. And I'm I'm wondering if since these men and women are are so far away from their constituents, days away, weeks away in some cases, from getting home, is there this perceived bubble these men are living in inside the halls of Congress? Yes, that's exactly what it is. I mean, I often call my book the inside the beltway story before there was a beltway. You know, we sort of talk about it like that today. They're, they are spending a lot of time in Washington and it is hard to get home. So, you know, our, our congressman today will get on a plane and, and be home, you know, for the weekend. But in the 19th century, they weren't doing that. In the antebellum period, they were constantly um isolated in Washington with their fellow congressmen. And so it was a really different experience from today's uh, Washington in that way. Um, they were forced into the um, social experience. I mean, you could you could decide not to go to dinners and parties and whatnot, but it, it meant that it, you had a real difficulty actually getting anything accomplished. And um, in the letters to their wives, congressmen often talk about this, you know, I'm I haven't been going to the parties, and so I'm not going to be able to have any influence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that that is really part of what what made it what it was. You know, it, it was the possibility that you could go out every night and have dinner with a new person, um, or you would have a, a group of people that you would have dinner with, or you know, if you lived in a boarding house with other uh, congressmen, you would end up speaking with them. I think. Um, there is very much this sense in the rest of the union during this period that congressmen are not necessarily doing the things that they want. Uh, and, and that's part of the reason why the Congressional Globe is so important and why you see 
um, congressmen speaking to their constituents through the Congressional Globe, even while they're not really necessarily holding fast to those ideas and how they vote or in sort of the negotiations behind the scenes. But I think it's also a big reason why you get Southern secession, because you see these folks uh, in Washington not doing what you expect them to do, not actually holding um, your strong beliefs in slavery as seriously as you are. And as a result, you're a, you know, white Southerners say, you know, we're, we're not going to stand for this. And if you read the se secession conventions, um, the, the, the w speeches that folks give there, they are complaining about Washington. They are complaining about Congress, they're complaining about the possibilities of the federal government. And that's, you know, that's not a new insight from me. That's something that historians have been saying for a long time. The question is why? And the, the answer is uh, that there was this Washington bubble. There was this sort of perception that these guys were, were just in it together. Mm -hmm. I think you do offer an important insight to that. You're correct. There are many historians who have argued, especially when it came to secession and the formation of the Confederacy, that it was a revolt against politics in large part because they were tired of the partisanship. There's a certain idealism that they thought they could somehow recapture, but you offer something different here. And that is, is that the voters themselves, as you've just pointed out, that's the lightning outside my house. So who knows? <laughs> I'll be on. I got to hurry to get my question. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of my question. Uh, and, and so that the voters, right, in a sense, feel like that they're being deceived. So here, here's my, I'm a student now, right? I've read your book. We've talked in class. And I come to you. I say, Professor Sheldon, you know what? Democracy is a sham. And it's a sham because what we continue to see, and we have a rule here, uh, Rachel, if you use a discourse, the word discourse three times every <laughs> this season, and John said one more time, he's going to just, I'm done. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I was I I was beaten in the head by Gary Gallagher never to use that word. Well, so <laughs> he died Gallagher as well, and I will tell him that that's wrong. It's the wrong. <laughs> it's used discourse. Discourse doesn't mean discussion. Right. I it hear means something it, else. It has an actual it, meaning. Yeah. Of course, this no <laughs> God Almighty. That's not what the word means. But I got off track. I'm in the area, and I'll say this: I'm your student, Rachel. I'm disillusioned and I'm disillusioned because it is clear that there's a public narrative, a dominant narrative. It is a narrative that to some degree has been falsified. And in that falsification of what's happening politically, people, you can't blame them. Hell, they're being misled. And I'll just even add to that. We can continue to see even today. And I don't care if you're right or left, Republican, Democrat, you go to CNN or you go to Fox, their dominant message. And it is one. It is uniform. And it has a, an obvious political purpose in a way that often mainstream media did not do that. But what I'm trying to get to convey is can we not understand and appreciate why there's so much cynicism historically amongst Americans, especially because what your book tells us, I'm disillusioned, Rachel. I see that democracy is a joke. People can't really get informed. They're being misled by these politicians. What would you well, so I would say that's actually not really true overall in the 19th century. I, it's true that they were disillusioned with the Washington politicians, but the, what they did not turn to was apathy toward politics. They yeah. turned toward other modes of politics. Yeah. Um, so local politics, state politics, but also um, the kind of politics that we don't think of as politics. So organizing, petitioning, all kinds of things to try to change the scenario. You know, for a long time, there was a belief that abolitionists didn't really engage in politics. And there's a wonderful book by Corey Brooks um, that teaches us the opposite of that. That in fact, abolitionists got really involved in um, congressional politics and got themselves elected and, and infiltrated and, and wanted to be part of the conversation uh, and did so really effectively. And in the 19th century, there were enormous numbers of people voting. Uh, you got up, you got up above 70% on average in every presidential election. You had upwards of 81 or 82% in 1840. And again, at the end of the century, people really cared about these positions. And so, yeah, there was partisanship, but you know, in fact, partisanship helped facilitate no the, the possibilities. And, and people complained about partisanship as they do today. Um, but they also engaged with it. And so there was a belief that politics actually was 
a, a mode to get what you wanted because democracy was the goal and democracy is based in politics. You can't, you can't really get around that. Well, you know what, as your student rates, I am almost entirely satisfied with this response. But John, I got to get my last little part in here. This isn't a question of participation. This is my question, is that how can you expect people to sort through these complex issues when, in fact, the politicians in D.C. are in their insulated bubble and the Congressional Globe is falsifying? And I'll even go back to your own chapter on the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the caning of, uh, of Charles Sumner. Uh, how that's being projected to the voters, fine, they're active, wonderful, but they're active in a way that they don't really understand what the hell is going on because they live within a world in which the news that they receive does a grave distortion to the other or to the opposition. Well, you know, I would say again, I think one of the things that my book is really about is how we give too much credence to these politicians in Washington. And in fact, the most important thing for us to do as citizens is to care about our local and state elections just as much as we care about the presidency and, and our congressmen. And those folks are not running in the same way, right? We're, we're dealing with different kinds of um, issues often on the state and local levels. And that was true. It, that was true in the antebellum period, too. That was true, especially throughout the North. There were people concerned about lots of other things besides what was going on um, with the presidency. Slavery, of course, was really important to everyone uh, in the South. Um, but you, you really you cared about what was going on in your local tickets then. And one of the problems, I think it's not to get too um, preachy about this in terms of our modern system, but I think one of the problems with modern democracy is that we don't give people enough information about how you engage with politics on the local and state level. Uh, and that's a failure of the parties. Uh, and it's a failure of our education system that we are so obsessed you know, we're really obsessed with the Supreme Court, but we don't know that much about how the rest of the federal courts or the state courts operate. We're really obsessed with Congress, but we don't know very much about what our state legislature is doing. How many people do you think can even name their state legislators? Not many, right? Mm -hmm. Often you can't name your your, <laughs> your um, congressman, but you definitely can't name your, your state legislature state legislators, and often you can't name the mayor of your town. These are people that are doing really important work. And it, in the 19th century, this was true too, uh, but folks had much more information about this. And and I think it's something that the parties ought to work more on, uh, but we as a society ought to work more on too. And the civic, civic education is pretty important. Well, Rachel, as long as I get an A in your class, I love you, Mr. Al. Sign up for your next class next semester. <laughs> As long as I get the A, though, I got to get the A. <laughs> All right, <laughs> uh, John. Good so, uh, so I'm going to defer my my time to the people in the comments because okay. right I'm a man of the people. So uh, first, uh, Kara has a question: uh, Has a book been written strictly on the wives of some of these congressmen? Yeah. So um, there's a book, not, not so much in the in the antebellum period, but there's a book on um, the women in of Washington, but written by Catherine Al Gore. Um, the name is escaping me right now, but it's A L L G O R, uh, and it's about w wives in the early republic and the the women of Washington in the early republic. It's really excellent, and so one of the books that I learned a lot from in in working on this. Um, and there were a lot of women in Washington who wrote about their experiences, uh, so you can you can get some first person accounts. But there hasn't really been a big book on the wives of Washington in Washington in part because most of them didn't live in Washington, to be fair. Yeah. Most of the men came without their wives and they wrote letters to their wives. Mm -hmm. uh, so you would end up with the women being really important from a different kind of standpoint. And uh, Heath Anderson, he read an interview where you mentioned the value of biography as a method of political history. Could you recommend a few examples of this type of scholarship? Oh, I'd be delighted. Um, one book that I think is just absolutely fantastic is a book about Edward Everett. Um, it's called Apostle of Union. Um, and it's written by Matthew Mason, who's a professor at BYU. It's just fantastic. I'm a really fan of Michael Woods' book, um, which, is, which has just come out. And I think he was on recently probably talking about it on Jefferson Davis and um, Stephen Douglas. 
So I, those are two places to start. Um, I, other books that are I really love that are a bit older, um, Joan Waugh's book on Ulysses S. Grant. I know she doesn't actually think that of her book as a biography, but um, it's it, it <laughs> might do the trick for you. <laughs> no, it's about her own book. It is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, right, those are just some places to start. But I think biography is is really really wonderful, and I actually think we're heading back in that direction. Well, I, I think. So much of our history is so complicated that it's really wonderful to be able to do it um, through the the eyes of one family or one person or maybe a few people. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think we're returning to that. What's your favorite Lincoln biography? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm pretty partial to the David Donald biography, which I think is very good and holds up. Um, but I also really like uh, Bill Ganap's little volume and um, Richard Carradine's little volume as well. All of those I think are very good. I think they're excellent as well. Yeah, they're good, they're good. John, keep going. Uh, we got a YouTube comment because we're live on YouTube as well. We are. Okay. So we're looking at pop history now because we're uh, kind of, because we have Joanne's book on I mean, that's a great how, one. How, does, how does yours compare? And he says afterwards, or contrast, or contrast. To, <laughs> Joanne's, to Joanne's book. Yeah, so I think um, Joanne and I sort of come at these issues from a little bit of a different angle because I think she's really interested in how um, congressmen and senators present out to the rest of the country um, in the way that um, they sort of are showing off their uh, their anger um, in, in the Congressional Globe and elsewhere. Um, and I'm much more interested in sort of their personal relationships beyond violence. So they they complement one another in that way in that if you want to really get a sense of who these congressmen were and what they were doing um besides being in congress then that's where i would start joanne is much more interested in understanding um the violence that does happen i think we have a slightly different interpretation of what that means yeah, uh, so she she tends to see it as something that is um De demonstrative of a of a Congress that is really fighting all the time, and I, I think it's actually much more about political theater, um, and and I th so that's a place I think we disagree. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some excellent questions, yeah. uh, John. If we don't have any more, I would, uh, if you don't mind, just show the website uh, mm -hmm. for the Richards Center because we didn't do that, did we? No, we did not. No, let's uh, let's do that. There we go. For those at home, uh, you can obviously Google it and you can see uh, the range of things. And again, Rachel, I'll leave it to you to explain your own website. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, you know, um, we we recently um, made a statement about um, police violence against the black community, which is the thing on the on the front there that you can see. And actually, if you um, click on a link to that, this this part right here, what can you do? Um, to support representation, inclusion, and equity. Uh, we give a, a list of places that you can get involved. Um, and that really shows how seriously we are taking this moment and also what we're thinking about in terms of how can you um, engage with these issues. Um, but the, the website has lots of information about how you can become part of the Richard Center, um, how you can, if you, if you decide to become a, a member, then you get a copy of the Journal of the Civil War Era, and you also um, get a copy of the Bros Lecture book uh, and the Tom Watson Brown Prize winning book. So um, that, is, that is a reason to join us, and, and you'll get occasional communications from me uh, about what we're up to. And if you're in the area, especially, it's a, it's a great um, place where you can come and actually see quite a few lectures and, and um, events. So yeah. you can get more information there. Right, right. The bros lectures are fantastic. I'm yeah. sorry about Ms. Lorian's uh, because I just think she's such a wonderful historian. She and is. She, yeah. she just, uh, I think, again, I, I, I've said this time and time again, Rachel has um, and spoken at, at CWI, and she knows this. I'm not just saying it because she's here, immensely popular with her audience. Oh, good. <laughs> well, you're just you're very engaging. You're very smart, and uh, you know you. I love your advisor Holt. <laughs> <laughs> the first conference paper I ever heard in grad school 
And I was so intimidated. And so yeah, intimidated. he's very intimidating. But, yeah. but it was an academic conference. And I think, you know, I, I believe that, you know, I know John and, and Rachel and so many others were so committed to taking scholarship and finding ways that people can really uh, think about it in, a, in an accessible way. And I, I, again, I appreciate what the center is trying to do, especially as an alum of Penn State. I think it's always a good thing when we try to get democracy out of its lethargy, and it is. Yeah. And, and, and again, I also want to be respectful of those who I have some deep concerns. And I, I was at the Battlefield Park today. There are a few people that had their Confederate flag T-shirts on. I had a wonderful conversation with them. Um, my great concern here is, you know, can you get peace and get justice? I'm an optimist at heart. I'm never going to let go of that. I always understand that these moments in history, though, that sometimes are winners and obviously losers. And who knows how this is all going to play out. But I still have to believe, again, after the conversation today, that damning people ain't going to get us very far. And trying to understand, in this instance, this was a man who's descended from a, a Georgia battery. He, he lived in uh, a Georgia artillery battery. He lived in California. Uh, you know, he was really happy to be there. And, and now that he's here, I'm hoping that he could think about his ancestors past in a way to understand, you know, why his ancestor made the decisions that he made. And, and I think that what you guys are doing at the Richard Center will also help people see how what we study in the past has this wonderful connection to these current events. And we can't let this slip through our fingers uh, at all. I took my students down to Richmond. And again, this is the thing that's so troubling to me. I had a call that someone said that I was celebrating with my students at the Lee Monument. But first of all, I wasn't even in the photograph. Uh, and, and, and again, I'm not saying that to make it all about me right now. I say all that because I'm troubled about our profession and about not just the public historians, but the academic historians, I hope. That's why, I, that's why I can't take, take Twitter there at all, right? Because I see such horrible behavior. I yeah. think more than ever now, we got to be civil to each other. We got to find a way to respectfully disagree and channel all that damn Twitter energy to Rachel's homepage. All <laughs> the organizations. Rachel, you've made some good points how we need right to get engaged locally, whatever you believe, hell. Right? Yeah. Do it. Yeah, and I don't, I mean, I don't mean that as a historian. I just mean that as a human being. I will say one thing about, about why I think um, historians are, are frustrated with one another. It's really hard to be operating, I think, in a situation in which um, we don't, our, our study, what we do is often not well respected by those in government. And so we often don't have the resources or the care by which our students can actually learn about these things. And of course, education does not fix everything and not everyone's minds will be changed by a class on the Civil War. But every time I teach a class on the Civil War, I know that I give students the opportunity to think about these things in ways that are better. And if we actually supported the university in a way where history classes mattered, where classes, where we're doing basic civics, but also where we're thinking about the past in serious ways mattered, then we might be in a different situation. But because we're not, we, we often feel that we have to take it to the to Twitter. <laughs> Turn the volume up, right? I think stop Twitter, go to the people. They want to hear you. I'm serious. I'll, I'll tell you, I think, you know, as someone who's who's relatively active on Twitter, I I see a lot of benefits to it. And again, I, 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 and again you probably thinking, Rachel, that I that I'm just always sort of buttering up. No, I've seen your tweets, I'm cool with them. Okay. No, they're informative, they're not inflammatory. You're um, not moral self-righteousness, man. You're trying to promote thinking. And Heather Cox Richardson, I really would like to meet her. I've never met her. Wonderful. She's oh, I love her. I'm so glad you brought her up. Heather Cox Richardson is one of my absolute favorite historians. And she is an inspiration for so many Absolutely. people of my generation. I mean, I'm the generation behind her, women who study politics. Mm -hmm. She really paved the way for us. And she often credits, I think, um, Jean Baker for being one of her inspirations in that same way. And, you know, 
it it can be done <laughs> in part because of these women. So Rachel, we go to Pete for the deep questions. <laughs> we, we, come, we come to me for the wild cards and we're, okay. speaking, about, we're speaking about Twitter. Yeah. Who's the antebellum politician you would follow on Twitter? If they oh, William Seward. No, no, no question. I, I have a little I, obsession I, with I, William Seward. <laughs> Okay. He's a fascinating I'm guy. You know, Seward, Seward had all these friends who were white Southerners. I mean, he he went down to the South and visited, you know, his friends down there. And and he was he was very seriously anti-slavery in the antebellum period. And his wife uh, was very involved in the Underground Railroad. If you ever go up and visit his house um, in Auburn, New York, you can see in the basement there is a there's a um, part that is that is dedicated to the Underground Railroad. And of course they that is the family that gave um, property to Harriet Tubman's family to live in um, very close by. Wow. So, you know, there he was a fascinating person. And in the antebellum period, and then I haven't even started to talk about William Henry Seward, Secretary of State. So, yes, I would. You know, the, one of my favorite things in researching um, the book was that uh, Seward came in for so much criticism on the floor of the Senate. You know, people were constantly bashing him. And then they would have dinner with him because they loved him so much. He was so fun. <laughs> I remember that in your book. Who did he? Who? There got a pretty heated argument with the Southern, I don't remember who it was now, but then afterwards they were at parties and they were like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Seward and Jefferson Davis were quite close. They yeah. they were actually, um, you might call them good friends. <laughs> when Jefferson Davis was ill uh, in, in the late 50s, Seward went and visited him and brought him soup and, you know, this yeah. was actually quite a good relationship and and his wife Jefferson Davis's wife Verena was very fond of William Seward so you know that he was a really fascinating guy he had a he had a lot of different um different ideas now if we we're talking about reconstruction politicians I might be more interested in Thaddeus Stevens who you know is really just one of the all-time greats but uh Seward for the antebellum period for sure yeah. nice yeah Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I, tend to have, I tend to have one or two. <laughs> well, who would you follow? John, would you, John, follow? Who would you follow? Who would you want to have a conversation with? Oh, man, who would I follow in the antebellum period? Uh, wow, that's a wonderful question. I think, uh, man. I don't know who I would follow. That's a great question because it's because I'm I've always been a fan of Thaddeus Stevens. So I don't know, but you're right. I'd rather follow Thaddeus Stevens in the Reconstruction era. Yeah. I mean, he was fine. He was totally fine in the in the antebellum period too. It's not like he was doing nothing, but uh, yeah. he really hits his stride in Reconstruction. I yeah. think I think Henry Clay would have been interesting too, but but yeah. he, way going back there a little ways. Yeah. Yeah. He I, would be, he would have been interesting. He's he definitely thought a lot of himself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He was, he was conceited, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think he had been interesting. I think he would have gotten some hashtags wrong. And yeah. so, he probably had a pretty big ego, huh? Oh, huge ego. Yeah. yeah, huge ego. You know, he was really mad in the Compromise of 1850 negotiations. He was really mad when his speech did not have the effect that he wanted to. He sort of slinked off out of Washington <laughs> because yeah. it was not successful. Um, and then, you know, Stephen Douglas and um, Millard Fillmore sort of cleaned up his mess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> Millard Fillmore's cleaning up your mess. Yeah, the, you know, you're in really big trouble with Millard Fillmore cleaning up your mess. I, was, I uh, visited Henry Clay's house in Lexington. Oh, yeah. And the dose was quite good, I thought. I didn't check into this, but Henry Clay's uh, support for the revolutions in Latin America in the 1820s. Uh, earned him such distinction in Latin America that the docent claimed that there were people in, who named their kids after Henry Clay uh, in Latin America. Have you ever heard that? Is that I true? Believe that. Yeah, I would believe that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah. So I asked I my father. Had very strange naming traditions in the 19th century. And because there were so many um, marriages of quite elderly men and very young women, you end up with some really odd yeah. versions. <laughs> Truman Smith, who was a who was a longtime politician, um, who was, you know, sometimes thought of as sort of the head of the Whig 
um, national committee that did not exist, but sort of the head of that. Uh, he, he quite late in his life married a very young woman and um, name, named, <laughs> named his children after Lincoln and, and Alexander Stevens. So, <laughs> so that's how you end up with that kind of thing, I guess. <laughs> Oh, no, maybe it was Zachary Taylor, Zachary Taylor, Lincoln and Zachary Taylor. At that point, probably Stevens was not not so well yeah. thought, of, but yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and Alexander Stevens and Lincoln, I mean, they were fairly close. They were, yeah. So, yeah, I have a chapter in my book about this. That Lincoln was in a in a debating club. Yeah. Uh, with, what was with, it called? It has an odd name. The Young Indian Club. Mm. Yeah, and they were, they were a club that... Uh, a, ostensibly was interested in electing a Whig president. And so they, you know, they were committed to Zachary Taylor, but they talked about other things and Lincoln and Stevens got on very well. Uh, they, they really liked each other. Well, they're both incredibly smart. I, yeah. mean, I mean, Stevens, cornerstone of the Confederacy, of course, is something we're all familiar with, yeah. but there was more to him than that. Well, you know, I think it's so funny. This is my one quibble with the the movie Lincoln, which I, I really like. I think it's excellent. But there's this scene near the end of the Hampton Roads meeting uh, that sort of portrays this as a super hostile, you know, moment. And in fact, it was quite pleasant. <laughs> all these people knew each other. They had all been in Washington together. They had all known each other before the war. And and so it was filled with pleasantries. Uh, so <laughs> that that's really... That gets my goat. I really get frustrated every time I see that, but uh, otherwise, very good movie. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, Rachel, you know, it's uh, it's really great to have you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. pleasure. To be able to talk about such a wide range uh, of, of issues about the field, about our field's relationship to the public. Um, like you said, uh, it really matters now more than ever. And so thank you again for taking time from your Busy schedule. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Thank really you. Pleasure. Thank you, Pete, yes. for being the co-hostess with Mostest. <laughs> uh, we have our last show, Rachel, is on Thursday. We do. We do. We're going out in style, I guess. Yeah. We're gonna, I might get dressed up for that one. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, Who's the last person? Our last person is, John, can you I look her up? She is. Oh, good, good God. How do we not remember this? Well, I forgot to get in. Oh, we're doing medical history of the Vicksburg campaign. Medical history of the Vicksburg campaign. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lindsay Prevett is. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Lindsay, Lindsay uh, I've not met Lindsay in person, but um, well, when I'm interested in her dissertation, which she's going to talk to us about. And she is also another example of an academic historian mm -hmm. who cut her teeth in public history yeah. for years. Yeah, in uh, at Vicksburg, and so you know, all this evidence is, a, I think, again, a testament to how our fields have, have come. Uh, absolutely, so, there are quite a few. We we've, we've yeah. sent some from Penn State too. Absolutely. <laughs> I met them down here as well. So it's yeah, it's wonderful. So mm -hmm. hey, thank you again, Rachel. Thank you. So Great. nice chatting with you all. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, in the comments for the awesome comments and questions we have posted. I, I pinned, repinned the book uh, with the with the link. And don't forget that you get 40% off with that discount code. So go and order your copy now. Uh, we do appreciate all the comments, questions, and a bunch of you shared it out. So thank you for that. Even hey. the book, John, the book can't even cover up all my hair. <laughs> I know. Me, right. I think it was pretty insensitive, especially on Father's Day. She said to me, I said, my hair is looking like a toupee. She said a toupee would look better on your hair. Oh, no. Why would you want to why would you want to cover that hair though? Yeah, I don't know. Why would you cover that up? That's that COVID cut hair. <laughs> Thank you, Pete, for, for co-hosting as always. Thank you again, Rachel, for your for Thank your you for having for me. Putting up with my wild question. No, that's uh, great. <laughs> Take care, everyone. We will see you on Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. <laughs>